I'm excited because our, our, our third phase, right? If it was come as you are and calling, today we're talking about what does it mean to be in this together? What does it mean to have community with each other? And as you guys know, I really enjoy sharing a good story before I get too far in any form of a teaching. Amen? Okay. <laughs> well, some of you know that. Anyways, um, it's funny. I, I, I really wanted to share this one specific story, but I'm going a different direction. And I want to tell you guys about a story that a few years back when I was leading a ministry uh, at UMW, uh, I, I was, we were really going deep into like just brother, this thing called brotherhood. Cole leads that now, which is pretty cool to have him in the house. And, um, and one thing that we started doing, we called man camp. Can you say that? Man camp? Man. Yeah, it was a good time. <laughs> and what that meant is that a bunch of guys got real crazy and real scrappy. And we said for a whole weekend, we're going to go in the woods and we're going to make fire and we're going to set up camp and we're going to make camp food and all this kind of stuff. We're going to hike to the top of mountains and scream at the top of them. Kind of like Rocky and Rocky Four, if you've seen that, where he's just like, Trico. It's a great movie, but highly recommend it. Got lost in it for a moment. So anyways, our very first time ever planning man camp. Super excited, right? Like reach out to I, I, you guys, a couple, a couple of you were here, the, I don't know, a few weeks back. I told you about the story of being on the Appalachian Trail with my dad, right? And Dr. Reddick, who was leading that class, well, I got Dr. Reddick to come down to man camp and to lead us for that weekend. And so we were a little worried about that weekend because of all the rain that it was calling for. And by the grace of God, it rained the whole week and it stopped moving into that Friday. So the good news was no rain to camp in, which if you were with me when I told you about the story of my dad hiking, right? Like that's a good, that's good news. The bad news was everything was wet. I'm talking everything. And if you've ever watched Survivor, it's a great show going on 44 seasons. Your fire is your life is a phrase that they say a lot. Fire is life when you're camping. So we're out there setting up camp and I'm thinking to myself, so I get this little bottle of what's called heat, H-E-E-T, not H-E-A-T, but it does produce H-E-A-T. It's this gas that is environmental friendly that helps you make fires out in the wilderness. Dr. Reddick taught me that trick. And so I'm thinking, okay, hey, Dr. Reddick, I'm going to, you know, get the fire going. I got this, you know, leader for the group and everything. And I'm getting up all this wood and I kind of build a little bit of a TP, go that method and try to light this thing. Right. And all of a sudden, like nothing happens. Absolutely nothing. Kind of light it again. Nothing happens. I'm like, Dr. Reddick, getting a little embarrassed, you know, a little frustrated. You know, when you get to that point, we're like, first time, it's not a big deal. Second time, okay, we're going to be fine. Third time, you're like, okay, I'm getting a little frustrated getting a little impatient here and go, Dr. Reddick, I don't understand. This is, he's like, oh, put some heat on it. I'm like, I already did. This is getting embarrassing, you know? And so finally he's like, oh, well, you're not using enough. And I'm like, well, dude, I'm not trying to like run out the whole, you know, in the first try on one weekend. So I'm like, okay, I'll put more on. So I douse this thing and all of a sudden I hear, I'm not kidding. I'll never forget hearing this now, this noise. I, I hear just a whoosh. And all of a sudden, like in slow motion, I'm watching the fire just engulf and it's just climbing so fast. And, I, you know, slow motion, I just see it. It's like whoosh and it's just coming, coming. All of a sudden I look at my hand, I'm holding the bottle of heat and my hand is on fire. <laughs> and I'm like, ow, and I drop it. But then I go into shock and I think, oh my gosh, I'm going to burn down the entire wilderness. I'm going to be that person that's on the news channel that burnt down the forest in the Shenandoah. And so what do I do? This whole thing is engulfed in flames. In shock, I pick it back up. My entire hand is on fire again. And then I go, ow, and I drop it again. I'm like, Dr. Reddick, what do I do? I'm in shock. And he's like, kick, stomp it out, stomp it out. So I stomp it out and I hear whoosh. And all of a sudden my whole foot's on fire. It's like a, a little bomb of flames all of a sudden. And I'm like, oh my gosh. He's like, no, put leaves over it and then stomp it out. I'm like, you didn't say that the first time to be fair. <laughs> So put leaves over, I stomp it out, crisis averted. The only problem is I have third degree burns all over my index finger. My, my index finger, like, it, 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 it looked like a finger, but a huge bubble, like a major bubble. It was really, really gross, really painful. It's one of those painful things I've ever experienced. I remember, um, you know, the first, like, hour, it's like, dude, this isn't that bad. I don't feel anything. And all of a sudden, it was like somebody just over and over again was cutting off my fingers, what it felt like with a machete, just... Boom, the pain was just unreal. It was throbbing. 
And so here was the problem, was that my plan was, I've got the wilderness experience with all these lads, these college kids, you know, that don't really know what they're doing. So I was going to lead the weekend, be the great hero, start the fire, which that didn't go well, you know, get all the food. I know how to use the stove, all this kind of stuff. And I couldn't do a thing with my hand. And it got so bad. The pain was so bad that I literally had to just sit near the river and dip my finger in the cold river the entire time. But the beautiful thing that came from this was that I had to use my voice being from the river and I had to just instruct man after man after man on how to prep the food, how to get the water boiling, you know, what to do. Obviously there's some instinct there, but just the different ways we need to do it and how we need to cook the food at the right time and what temperature and when it's actually finished. And one of the most beautiful things that ensued in that moment was what we noticed was that all these guys just came around a problem and solved it by leaning on each other. And the beauty was me just getting to sit there and realize this is actually amazing what's happening. I'm watching guys boil the water and collect river water. I'm watching guys preparing the meal and pouring the rice into the water and stirring. I'm watching guys go collect plates and all this kind of stuff. And we get to the point where all the food is getting ready to be eaten and it's just one person after the next just serving each other, putting food on a plate, handing it to the next person, handing it to the next person. And in this moment, I realized this was definitely God's plan. Unfortunately, I had to go through a lot of pain to experience it. And the next year we did man camp, I knew immediately it was, it's about teamwork, man. It's about all of us kind of showing up and doing what we can to serve each other. And so why do I share that story? Not to relive a very painful moment in my life, but what happened in this story was that a, a few things. There was a commitment, right? There was a commitment to each other that would go, I'm willing to do this one job to the best of my ability because I know that you're doing this job to the best of your ability and these are going to serve our needs together. And it created what Dr. Reddick would call communitas. Communitas being that we're forming an organic community within each other that's putting others' needs before our own but there was also a faith factor that we knew that if I do this well, then it's going to provide food for the other person next to me and they'll do the same thing for me. And my whole point of this story is that this is such a beautiful image to what we get to be as a community in God's family, is that it's not one person doing everything for an entire people group or a body. It's a lot of different people showing up and coming together around each other, a camaraderie, a camaraderie that comes around each other and serves the needs of others. In fact, Paul would say this in Philippians 2. They're going through a crisis. Their community is going through intense persecution. It's a church that's brand new, maybe a couple months old. And he says, here's the trick. You want to know how to survive? Count others as greater than yourself. See that person to your left, to your right, that person that you can't stand sometimes, the person that annoys you and frustrates you, maybe the person you idolize, the person you always compare yourself to, take a step back and treat them as greater than yourself. Now here's the beautiful thing about that, that that only works when it's an entire buy-in of a whole community. Because here's when you run into that problem where you've got a lot of, of abusive and hurt culture where all of a sudden people are going, well, I'm always laying my life down for my friends. And I'm always trying to serve the needs of my community. And I'm always trying to treat others as greater than myself. It's a community thing. It's, 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 a, it's a corporate thing that we invite each other into that. And then Paul, after charging them to consider this, he goes into considered Christ, who from the highest point in the heavens would humble himself in the form of man and become obedient to death, even death on the cross. See, what Paul's doing to the church at that time is he's saying the only way you're going to endure is when you choose to have a humility in how you treat each other. And if that's not enough inspiration and influence, consider Jesus who laid his life down for you. And so the gospel has to be the center of how we even form community in the first place, doesn't it? See, I love what um, Robert Mulholland, a spiritual teacher and an author, he says this that we can no more be conformed to the image of Christ outside of corporate spirituality than a coal can continue to burn outside of the fire. Mm -hmm. That corporate spirituality, what this moment is, that we come together, we worship Jesus together, we open up His Word and we glean at His presence, and there's something that starts to happen within each one of us. There's a corporate 
spirituality. There's a community coming around the presence of Christ. And he's saying that the way that a coal can burn is that it has to burn within the fire. The second you take a coal out of the fire, what happens? It dims. Its heat loses itself, right? There's, there's no longer a fervency that keeps the coal aflame. And in so many ways, that's how God has designed community. My first point, and I want to make this so clear, is that you were made for community. You were made for community. Think about this for a second. That God, the Word tells us, created you in His own image. Gosh, I, just, I love just thinking about that. Like I've heard that so many times in my life. But you were created in the image of your Creator. He called you His masterpiece. But think about this. That if we are created in the image of God, who is God? See, God reveals Himself in the form of a trinity. Three persons in one. I've studied that for about two years now in seminary, and i got to tell you, it doesn't get any more clear. It's one of the most complicated things I think we have in our Christian faith. But this is how God, this is who He is, and this is how He reveals Himself to us. Three in one. And if God created you in His own image, we look at God as Trinity, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have perfect community and unity with each other. In fact, if you read the Gospels, I love this. Just like thinking about this, that Jesus would go, well, I've only come to do the works that my Father allows me to do. So I've only come to be a, an image bearer for who I want you to understand, which is the Father. And the Father goes, oh, well, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, the revelator, because the only way you're going to make sense of any of this is when you have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit goes, well, I'm not going to do anything without the Father sending me and the Son giving His life so that heavens can rip open and I can come and be a friend to you. And so we see this triangle of unity between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, the Creator. That's who He is. Then He creates you in His own image. And we look at the Genesis narrative, right? That it's not good for man to be alone. alone. Right? So what does God do? He creates Eve, and all of a sudden we have man and woman, and it's not good for man to be alone. And here's what's interesting, is I love this, and what Jesus does in his ministry in Matthew 12, 50. So kind of in the second year of his ministry, he's pretty popular at this point. He's doing a teaching in a house, and all these people are gathered, and there's kind of a love-hate thing with Jesus going on in this moment. See, some people love him because they think that he's going to be the, the king of the Jews who's going to overcome the Roman government. They think that that's their way out of oppression, is that Jesus will overrule, overrule the government. So some people love him, and some people hate him. Some people are uh, just absolutely at arms with this man that is ruining the religious structures and hierarchies. And so they get to talking to his mother, Mary, and it's pretty much just, hey, Jesus, yeah, he's a little crazy. He keeps referencing to being the Son of God. So can you and his brothers do something about it? Because it's really embarrassing all of us. And so in this moment, as Jesus is teaching, it's such an awkward moment because his mom and his brothers come to pretty much arrest him, pretty much to grab him and put him in house arrest in the basement. And as they're coming to him, trying to get into him, all these people in his house, as he's teaching them, and Jesus says this, and oh my goodness, don't take notes, you guys. Don't ever say this to your mom. You're not Jesus, right? <laughs> Just saying. Let's not do this. But Jesus says, who is my mother or my brother but those who do the work of my father? Okay? Here's what he's saying. Is that he just, in that moment, he constitutes spiritual family. See, so when your mom says to do something, do it. Right, Simon? Got the, got the whole thing on wraps? I'm not trying to preach a message in that way. But what Jesus is saying is that this is a new thing that I'm doing. That this is what spiritual family is, that we come around God's presence and we live in God's presence. And so in this very moment, Jesus changes the script and he says, this is who we are, that we are family, that we do the work of the Father. And so this is who we get to be in the image of who God is. We get to be the family of God, that it's not good for man to be alone. And it's not just about being married to somebody or having a significant other. It's that we get to be a spiritual family in community together. Does that make sense? Yeah. I love what Rich Velota says. He's a pastor in uh, New York, written a lot of really good books. And he says this, Jesus teaches us to pray, Our Father, not my Father. 
Paul uses the phrase, our Lord, 53 times, and my Lord only one time. Jesus as my personal Savior is not found in Scripture. And Rich Velotis goes on to say this, we are a people of God and we belong to each other. So what I want you to understand, and, and really for us to understand, is that we were literally made and designed to be in community together, not apart from it. Here's the problem. There's a bad guy in the story, right? The devil. And if God's desire for us is to be connected in spiritual community together, the devil's goal is to isolate you from community, right? Think about this in the beginning of the garden narrative, right? We talked about Adam and Eve. It's not good for man to be alone. There's that moment where the serpent, who is craftier than all the other animals, he comes up to Eve and he goes, did God really say this? Why would God say that? Oh, you won't die. No, no, no. And he convinces her on this lie that God is holding back from you. And if you'll just eat this fruit, you'll be greater or you'll be just as great. And so here's the interesting thing. And I really want to come after this is that I think one of the biggest ways the devil loves to try and convince us to be isolated from community is that he gets us to worship ourselves and not God. In other words, I want to say this really quick. See, I think the goal of the enemy is not to get you to be against God. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it will work, but it's not to get you to be against God. It's just to get you to be only for yourself. I'm going to say that one more time. The goal of the enemy is not to get you to be against God, but for yourself alone. Not to get you to be against your neighbor or your community, but to be so consumed by yourself. Did God really say this? And so what we find is that when we become so insular and so focused on ourselves, we buy the lie of the enemy that goes, you, know, you can't give yourself to community or you'll get hurt by community. I love what Brett McCracken, Christian author, he says this about consumerism. That consumerism is about the unlimited choice and unlimited speed. We choose exactly what we want. We take only what we want from it and we move on. This mindset has infiltrated the way we approach church as a thing we can design accordingly to the checklist of our own preferences. He's talking about consumerism. I just wanted to, I was thinking about this a little bit. Maybe just a few things of what we want to be aware of when it comes to consumerism. I think sometimes it's, we only attend some things when it feels convenient for us to attend. Maybe some resonation. I feel like I say that word every week. How about never asking about others, but only sharing about yourself? I could. Never asking about others, but only sharing about yourself. How about never serving, but only being served? This one really convicted me because I've been there so many times. How about searching for ways to be offended by others, otherwise known as a victim mentality, so that it's all about you? Well, so-and-so did this to me and so-and-so did this to me. They didn't say hi to me or they didn't hang out with me or they don't pursue me. You know, one of my biggest questions when I hear that from somebody is, what if you reached out to them? What if you said hi to them? What if you, pers what if you initiated contact with them? But the devil loves to get us to think you're the victim and people are always going to let you down. And so you just keep painting this picture that it's them and it's never you. And what happens? But division comes from that place. Just a few more. Thinking pessimistically towards others and never optimistically. Convicted of that one too. Never giving people the benefit of the doubt. How many times have I been there where I'm thinking this negative, well, this person's thinking this because of this. Or they do this because they think this. And then I literally learn that it wasn't that at all. Or, oh, they're not reaching out to me or they're not replying back to me because of this. And then like, Five minutes later, I think that I get a text from them or something, right? They reach back out and I'm like, dang you on it. Shot myself in the foot again, right? What about this? Seeing commitment as a burden instead of a blessing. See, what I'm trying to tell you, was that enough? I, that's all I have on my list. There's probably a lot more. But, but what I'm trying to tell you guys is that we have to be so careful of this thing of self-consumerism because when we're so consumed by ourselves, we'll see everybody else as a competitor. And it doesn't become, you're my teammate. It becomes, you're just trying to steal from me. And the only one that's trying to steal from you in actuality is the devil. But he'll try to manifest himself in the image of other people to create division. I want to say this really quick, that if, 
if you think that it's always meant to be about you, if you do church, you do gatherings, you do hangouts, then you won't only convince yourself that your community has yet again let you down, but in actuality, you are the one that has let it down. I feel like that's kind of a heavy thing to say, and I want to salt it with a little bit of love, but I'm just trying to tell you guys, when we do this, right, we, we gather in the presence of Jesus, but I'm telling you, I'm so convinced by this, that if we just do this and go at the end of the day, I'm sneakily building my own kingdom, then you will be let down every time because we don't want to build our own kingdom. We want to be so sold out for the Lord that we throw the crown that we're given in heaven at the feet of His cross, at the feet of His throne, and go, He is the only one worthy. But if we aren't careful, we make this so about ourselves, and then we get disappointed in our community, and we start to suck the life out of people. We start to suck the life out of an atmosphere and out of a culture. I mean, it's just crazy. We're feeling people. We're, we are a living energy. I know it's kind of like, more psychological framework and idea, but it's actually true that when you walk in a room, whether you've got a big personality or not, you can either add to it or take away from it. And if you're going to add to it, here's how it's going to happen. You don't show up for yourself. You showed up for the Lord first and foremost, but you showed up for the other people. And guess what? The way that works is that they didn't show up for themselves either. They showed up for you. And all of a sudden, there's something beautiful. I just want to give a quick example of that. We were a little short staff today, right? Our buddy John is shooting a wedding. And so we're kind of just trying to figure out, I'm texting Nick and Jordan, kind of my go-to guys. And I'm like, hey, you know, we're down on the camera. We got to figure something out. And in the moment, Jordan goes, hey, I'll just do both. I'll run the slides for the message and I'll run the camera. And so in this moment, right, that's Jordan going, I'm not going to do anything out of selfish ambition. In other words, it's just fancy biblical words for, I'm not going to do this for me. I'm going to do this for someone else. But then I know Jordan, and I go, bro, if you do that, you're going to burn yourself out and have a really terrible Sunday, so I can't let you do that. To me, that's a really good example, really minor, right, a micro example, but it's one person going, I see you in need, I want to help, but another person going, but I see your need, and so I'm not going to let you help because I know that will hurt you. Does that make sense? That's how simple it is. We do this for each other. We don't live in selfish ambition or vain conceit. We show up for each other, and the enemy can't take anything from you in that moment. Amen? Amen. I'm not done with that point yet. Because I was thinking about this, and I feel like much of that reaction, that list I just named, because like, if you want to tear something out, right, you don't just kind of trim it because it won't go away. If you've got a weed, you've got to pull the roots out. And I want us to pull the roots out of this thing. Yeah. The, I think what happens is that much of those reactions come from a place of fear. In some ways, it can come from the natural man. Because if I'm honest, right, like there's times where I wake up and I don't want to serve my wife or I don't want to serve my friends and then I have to die to myself a little bit and go, you know what, maybe it's time to carry a cross, even if it's a small one, and do it. But that doesn't come naturally to me. I'm not like that. I'm not wholly like that, right? But I think the other part of that is that sometimes it can be rooted in fear. What I know about fear is that it tends to be the birthing canal for lies. Lies we believe come from fear that we've given acceptance to. Is that right? Some agreement? Here's the interesting thing. I think the fear, when it comes to community, maybe some of you as I'm even talking about this, maybe this is a trigger word for you. Maybe community is not something that's easy for you to want to buy into or give yourself to. And I want to say that God's a good counselor, that he'll walk with you in the trauma, in the hurt, in the rejection, whatever it was, God loves you enough that he's not telling you to sprint past it. He's saying, let's go through it as slowly and as easily as we need to. But I think sometimes we believe this fear that if we give ourselves to community, it will lead us to feeling used, abused, and if it's a Christian community, a little confused, right? Because it's like, wait a second, these were supposed to be the good guys. I joined up with the good guys. Why am I getting stabbed in the back? I joined up with the good guys. Why am I being lied to, led on, right? So all of a sudden, this fear takes root and it births a lie, and then we believe this lie. And the lie is, if I resist the invitation to community, then I can't be used. If I, if I don't give myself to people, they can't take advantage of me. Y'all, I want to tear this lie down. I believe today that we can actually receive a Holy Spirit deliverance from the lies that we believe. And let's just break this down a little bit. It's interesting that Barna, 
Barna is like a Christian think tank, right? Like they, they poll Christians all across America and they take these statistics. So there's a lot of validity to their stats. And they did this. They asked a, a lot of Christians, a good sample size portion. And they said, how do you want to follow Jesus? And the largest category checked was me and Jesus. That's it. Just me and Jesus. Don't want to be a part of a church. Don't want to be a part of a small group. Don't want to be a part of anything else. Just want it to be me and Jesus. 63% of boomers, so that's kind of more our grandparents' generation, if you're wondering the age range, would say that they would prefer not to be a part of community. So that's the oldest, right? Here's the youngest. 46% of Gen Z see their Christian walk as private. That's half of the generation that's being raised in the faith right now that is believing a lie that their faith is meant to be private. And I need to tell you right now, whether you're Gen Z or not, right, that your faith is not meant to be private. That's exactly what the devil would like. It's exactly how he attacked Eve, exactly how he got Adam and Eve separated from God in isolation. And so we want to shed light on this lie to go that we're meant to be in this thing together, that we were made for community. And here's what I would say. How do you rebuttal a lie? You speak truth to it, right? You take that lie and you just flip it upside down a little bit. If the lie is, I'm going to resist myself from community so I can't be used, abused, and confused, I would say this is the truth. Give yourself to community and it won't lead you to feeling used, but it should leave you feeling utilized. It's not about feeling used, but you should be feeling utilized. I remember years ago, I was playing travel soccer, soccer player my whole life. And I was coming back from an injury and I was so excited for the game. We traveled all the way in Northern Virginia and I'm warming up with the team and I'm feeling better. I'm coming back from injury. And I remember our team losing and I sat on the bench the whole game. And I came up to my coach after the game and I just was so full of emotion and hurt because I wanted to give something to my team. And I said, if you were going to have me sit the bench the whole time, then I should have sat right next to my parents. That's what I did when I was injured. And I just walked away. Now, I probably could have had some better character there. I'm not going to lie about that. But what was my point? Was I want to be utilized, coach. I don't care if I have to run up and down the field. Gosh, I was begging for the bench last week in, uh, in, in the field house. We're not going to talk about that. That was really not my best hour. Claire saw the whole thing. Charles. So sorry, guys. <laughs> Publicly apologize to you for that performance. But when I was a, a kid in shape, playing soccer with my team, I wanted to be utilized. Like I wanted to be in the game, whether it was five minutes or 50 minutes. I wanted to help the team, right? And this is what's interesting to me, and I just kind of wanted to say this, that sometimes I feel like we're getting utilized and, and we kind of make it seem like we're getting used and we just have to be really careful the discernment of those, both, those, those two things. Like the more we buy into this thing, the more that we should be used and utilized, right? But how do we discern the difference between being used and utilized? We love each other. Like it's that simple. This is the beautiful thing. I'm going to fast forward a little bit on you, Jordan, but it's kind of my third point. We're going, to, we're going to connect these two things. But we give ourselves to community, especially when it's not perfect. See, I think too many of us, I just want to read this quote to you guys really quick. It's, it's Brett McCracken again, and he says this, the perfect fit for me impulse of consumerism almost always fails us. When we marry someone on the basis of how well they match up with our list of desired qualities, what happens when they or even we inevitably change? There is neither a perfect for me person nor a perfect for me church. In relationships and in faith, it's about commitment rather than consumerism. Finding ways to serve rather than desiring to be served. Filling a need rather than finding a niche. This is the uncomfortable but crucial cost of following Christ. That's good. That's really good. And so I want to stay on this for a second because I actually really believe that we have to discern what's the difference between being used by people and utilized by a community. Here's the interesting thing. If you're familiar with the gospel narrative, Simon Peter, right? We love him. He's crazy. He's always the first to do things for better or for worse. If you read the Bible, you know. And there's a moment where Peter denied Jesus three times. And so fast forward to the resurrection. Spoiler, Jesus got up out of the grave. Come on, somebody. There we go. And Peter's feeling shame. He's feeling condemnation. 
He wants nothing to do with Jesus in a lot of ways. And I love this moment that Jesus is having breakfast with the boys on the beach. And he takes a moment. He says, Peter, come here, man. Peter, I just, I, I, I can't imagine that feeling of dread. It's like when I chase my dog down and I'm really upset. And I can just see it in her eyes. Like she's kind of coming closer to me. I'm like, I'm not going to strike her. I'm not going to strike her. I don't sometimes. But Jesus says something really interesting to Peter in that moment. He says, do you love me? Three times, right? And each time he's like, yes, I love you. And once Jesus gets to this point of going, okay, good, because that's what it's about. It's not about what you didn't do or what you did. It's about, do you love me? That's how you can lead the church. That's how you can be the church, is do you love me? But then Jesus says something that's a little cryptic, if we're not familiar with what exactly he's saying, but I'm going to pick up John 21, 18. He says, very truly, I tell you, Peter, that when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Now here's what Jesus is saying to him. He's going, Peter, when you were a fisherman, bro, you could have done whatever you wanted. Like you could have done anything. But all of a sudden, when you start to follow me, there's this thing called conviction that you live in. And so why was Peter convicted? If Peter had never followed Jesus and then denied him as the Messiah three times, it would have just been another regular Tuesday. Like it wouldn't have mattered to him. But there was a conviction that that was his friend. There was conviction that he was called to something greater than being a castaway of denying Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so in this moment, Peter is being told by Jesus and he's saying, Peter, you just can't live fervently fir anymore. Oh my gosh, I don't know if I said that right. <laughs> you can't just do everything you want to do all the time anymore. There's a commitment to leading people. There's a commitment to laying your life down for your friends. There's a commitment to being the church together. And he's telling Peter, I love this, that it's literally Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death which Peter would glorify God. Do you know why Peter died? It was because he stood for the faith. It's because he stood for something he believed in. He didn't deny Christ on the day of his death. He stood and said, go ahead, but you can't crucify me on that cross. Not the way my Messiah died. You've got to put it upside down if you're going to kill me because I'm not worthy to die the death of my master. That's someone that knew Jesus. That's someone that had friendship with God. And why then would Jesus say, when you were young, you could do whatever you wanted, but now you can't do that anymore? It's conviction, my friends. It's what God is inviting us into and what he has called us to live as, that we don't live as though the world lived. And this is the thing, is that when we are the church together, we're not alone anymore. Like, we lay our lives down for each other. We, we listen to each other. We challenge each other. We ask hard questions. We pray for each other. We contend for each other. We don't let each other fall short of the glory of God. And that's burdensome. Like, that's not easy. That's tiring. And, and you, you, there's moments where you feel hopelessness. And you're tired of praying for the same person over and over and over again, never wondering if there's ever going to be change. But we thrust ourselves into that because that is what God has called us to do as a community. See, the difference between being used and utilized has everything to do with love. Jesus said this in John 13, a new command. He's saying this to his disciples. A new command that I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you will love one another. See, when you were young, you could live whatever life you wanted to live. You could do whatever you wanted to do. But as you get older, you know, I think about this, like I'm not a parent yet, right? But being a parent, right? All of a sudden, it's like, I don't want to have to attend my child in this moment, but I don't have much of a choice because I was the one that created this beautiful thing. Or think about when I'm, you know, being married, right? I want to watch football all day and hang out with the guys, but I'm married. And so there's a responsibility and there's a commitment. But it's not even just if you're a parent or if you're married. What about just being a good friend? I mean, have you ever had a friend going through something and they've really wanted your support and it conflicted with something else you wanted to do? But for the sake of friendship, you said, you know what? 
I'm going to forego this to support this person. It's being a good friend. What about holy conviction as believers? Guys, I just want you to hear this. Like we're called to live a countercultural life. We don't live as the world lives. We don't speak like the world speaks. We don't judge like the world judges. Do you hear what I'm saying? Like there's a completely different life that we live. And the beautiful thing is that to be the church isn't just confound to being in a building, but it's being a people, whether it's being dads raising your children, you know, grandmas watching their babies, husbands pursuing their wives, friends supporting each other. That's what it's about. That's what we get to do. And the beautiful thing is this, is that God plans to use people in our lives to spiritually form us. The narrow road is not a lonely road. It might be narrow, but we get to go there together. Community is the context where we experience transformation. If I can get the worship team or somebody to play, it would be amazing. Community is the context where we are transformed. We need each other. We cannot do this thing alone. Sam, why, you jump on here, bro. You got the keys. I know You know what you're doing. Come on, man. That's it. Just as we close in this moment, we actually need each other. I remember I always had this vision of getting married. And I always thought, man, my wife, whoever she is, she's going she's gonna to realize how much of Jesus I'm like. I had this excitement. <laughs> no, I really did. And then once I got, you know, once I started pursuing Amanda, I realized it's quite the opposite. She's not realizing how much of Jesus I'm like. She's exposing how much of Jesus I'm not like. And by the grace of God, with patience, she's helping me get there, right? Amen? And that's what we get to be for each other. Like, we don't put up this for sale sign and go, we are the perfect church. We are the perfect people. It's quite the opposite. I'm broken in need of a Savior. I'm sick in need of a doctor. There's nothing that I offer that is of perfection but I want to be personal about who I am and how I live. And this is what it means to be the church, is that we get to do this thing together. I love what Ronald Rollhauser says. Anyone who says he or she loves an invisible God in heaven and is unwilling to deal with a visible neighbor on earth is a liar since no one can love a God who cannot be seen if they cannot love a neighbor who can be seen. Christian spirituality is always about dealing with each other as much as it is dealing with God. And this is our call as believers that we might want to go, well, I just want to gaze into the eyes of Jesus and that's good and that's beautiful, but we get to do this thing together. And as much as we don't look like Jesus, we still choose each other to pursue him together. There's both exposure and encouragement in being in community together encouragement, exposure and encouragement. What I mean by that is exposure. You start to realize, you know what? We might be the church, but we're a little broken. We are not perfect. We think things we shouldn't. We fall to things we shouldn't. The question is, do we love each other to get back up and go and sin no more like Jesus so famously told people? The encouragement is that you realize you're not alone. The encouragement is that in the midst of your struggle or your brokenness there's a healing to come because you're not alone in that there's accountability that you don't have to be alone in it any longer and I think if community is the mirror to our blemish it's also the healing balm to our wounds if there's really anything I'm trying to say it's, it's this is that we just want to be a church that does life together whether that's going to Belvedere on a Friday night, hanging out with anyone, any, anywhere from people older to us than so much littler than us, slowing down in a corn maze or breaking the rules in a corn maze to walk through it because someone got a little scared and needed to get out. Like that's a beautiful image of what it is to do community. We don't show up for ourselves. We show up for each other. We don't show up for ourselves. We show up for each other. And we come around the presence of Jesus. And when we do that, man, we just don't miss it. He's going to honor that. I just want to close with this quote. These guys, they wrote a book called The Slow Church. And their point is this. We need to, their, their point is the church is it's becoming this fast-growing business institutional model. That's not what we see in the book of Acts. 
We see people that are doing life together, breaking bread together in their homes, opening up the Word of God together, worshiping together, praying together, laughing together. And they say this, long-term interpersonal relationships, that's just another fancy word for being intentional as friends, is the crucible of genuine progress in the Christian life. See, people who stay, grow, and people who leave do not grow. This is what these guys said. It is a simple but profound biblical reality that we both grow and thrive together or we just don't grow much at all. Now it just, my prayer for us as a church would be that every week we do this, even when these guys are worshiping, I'm thinking, man, how do I insert myself into worship to lead with them, not just be led by them? How do we do it together? When we're in our small groups together, and you got a person that can't even work up the words because they're so ho feeling hopeless and frustrated with the shortcoming, but looking them in the eyes and going, man, I have faith for you. Now think about, just in closing, I think about that famous story in the Gospels of the friend that was paralyzed. All of a sudden there's word around town that Jesus the Messiah the man that had healed blind eyes, the man that had touched the leper and his skin suddenly was healed and the wounds were vanished, the one who touched a, a woman with a bleeding disorder for 13 years was fully healed and they go, hey, we, we gotta get there. No, 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 I, I mean, think about that story. You guys go without me, I don't wanna hold you up again. Aren't you tired of not getting to do the fullness of what you want because of my ailments. I just imagine like smacking that person in the face. Like you don't get a say in the matter. We're gonna carry you. It was a far journey. I think about the moments where they probably had to take breaks, put their friend back down on the mat, and they're just, oh man, like stretching their back out. What must it have meant for that man to just see his friend sweaty and tired and just to lay there limp? thinking, what friends do I have that they would carry me all this journey? They get to this house and there's nowhere to get even close to Jesus. Guys, it's okay. Just you go in and tell me what he says. Let me know. No, no, no. Look at that. You see that chimney? We could totally take that thing out. Go right down it. Pre-Santa Claus. And what must it have been like to be that friend completely paralyzed and hearing the friends go, we aren't taking no for an answer. We didn't come to see him ourselves. We came just that you could. What must it have been like for that paralyzed man to see his friends ripping a roof off of someone's house they did not know? And then to lower their friend with every ounce of strength they had left. And Jesus sees the whole thing. He sees these friends that are ripping the roof apart. He sees this man that's low, being lowered down that can't even move. Your faith has healed you. Your sins are forgiven. And in that story, the man gets up, gets his back. Can you imagine the friends? Man, I'm so glad you could walk because I couldn't carry you another day, man. Can you imagine the friendship of just going, I can't believe you guys. And the stories they would tell their children. You know, like the stories they would tell their children's children. I was once paralyzed and I couldn't walk and I had an encounter with the man Jesus, but it was because my community got me there. My friends got me there. That's good, dude. What if that would, that could just be our heart cry? Everything that I do, every breath that I give, every word that I speak, every action that I make, every decision I commit to, what if it was for my spiritual family and not for me? What if they did the same thing for me? And so I could never feel used, but only utilized. Let's pray together.